authors at Alden. Although I don't know if any of us are actually at Alden right now, but <laughs> in spirit we are. Um, so today it is my great honor to introduce our esteemed guests, Dr. Carolyn Bailey Lewis, who will be interviewing Dr. J.W. Smith about his 2019 book, From the Back of the Bus to the Front of the Classroom, My 30-Year Journey as a Black and Blind Professor. Dr. Smith earned a BA in History and Speech Communication from Indiana University in 1982 and an MA in Speech Communication from Purdue in 1985 and his PhD from Wayne State University in 1989. Dr. Smith has been teaching since 1983 and is a professor in the School of Communication Studies at Ohio University. He is a renowned researcher in the areas of communication and disability and African-American rhetoric. In addition to the book that he's talking with us uh, about today, he is also the author of the book Essays on Communication and the Blind and Visually Impaired, as well as numerous book chapters, conference papers, and articles, including articles in the Braille Monitor, the flagship publication of the National Federation of the Blind. In 2004, Dr. Smith was awarded the National Federation of the Blind Educator of the Year Award, and in 2007, the NAACP Image Award for Research and Teaching. He has served on the Ohio Governor's Council on People with Disabilities and as president of the National Federation of the Blind of Ohio. And in 2018, Dr. Smith was selected to serve on the State Rehabilitation Council for Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities. Interviewing Dr. Smith today is Dr. Carolyn Bailey Lewis, an Ohio University Emerita in Communication Studies with over 38 years of experience as a public broadcasting and media professional. She earned a BS in 1971 and an MS in 1987, both from WVU, and her PhD in Communication in 2007 from Ohio University. Dr. Lewis has worked at West Virginia Public Broadcasting and at the WOUB Center for Public Media here at Ohio University. Dr. Lewis was the first Amer African American in the United States to serve as a general manager in a public television station. In 1993, she was awarded the Neil S. Bucklew Social Justice Award from West Virginia University, and in 2001, the Telly Award for her narration of Wandering Souls. In 2015, she was elected the hometown hero of South Est Southeast Ohio by the American Red Cross. And in 2020, she earned the Medal of Merit for Professional Achievement from the Ohio University Alumni Association. So join me together in clapping with your mics on or off to welcome our very esteemed guests. We're so happy to have you here and very eager to hear everything you have to say. Uh, to the Dean in his absence, and thank you, uh, Dean Kelly, and to Jen in the Alden Libraries. We appreciate this Authors at Alden opportunity and JW for asking me to be your interviewer. I appreciate that. My colleague, mentor, brother, and friend, JW has spent more than 30 years inspiring, challenging, and encouraging in shaping the lives of thousands of students along with effecting change for persons with disabilities in the university in Athens communities and beyond. Helen Keller said, optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. Like Keller, advocate, remarkable, extraordinary abilities, activists, living with no boundaries to courage and faith, author, such is the exceptional life, exceptional life of J.W. Smith, his optimism, hope, and confidence, despite the disability, has led to achievement beyond measure for this man of faith, humor, and intellect. J.W., good to see you again. Well, it's always good to be with you, lady. When I teach classes at the beginning, sometimes I ask my students, who are you? Who do you want to be? And they'll say, well, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, yeah. mechanic, nurse, whatever. And I said, no, 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 it's not the what, mm. the who. So who is J.W. Smith? Who am I? Um, boy, I, I, uh, I, I am a person who is inspired to inspire. I am... Um, 
a whistler and a hummer, <laughs> which usually uh, is uh, is a telltale sign of how I'm feeling, which is basically hopeful and optimistic most of the time. Uh, and I'm a I'm a person who likes to feel good and make others feel good. And who inspires you then, if you could name one or two people? Mm -hmm. um, there's so many. Uh, there was a drama teacher that I had in high school. Yes, I was in drama and I was in plays. One of them being Raising a Son. <laughs> I, was, I was Walter Lee Younger. I'll never forget it. Uh, but a drama teacher, her name was Mrs. Hall. I, know, I don't talk enough about Mrs. Hall, but she taught me a valuable lesson one time. I was performing at, at, as a senior in high school at one of our uh, rallies or assemblies, whatever it was, and I finished playing the piano and I had sung, I think it was God Bless America or something, and I went back to my seat and and people were clapping and cheering and I went back and relaxed and took it easy and was observing others. And about 20 minutes after that, she came over and tapped me on the shoulder and she said, you know, it's okay if you clap for other people too. And boy, that just taught me such a valuable lesson. So I never have forgotten that. And then of course, my, uh, my grandmother that raised me, you know, I, I would say that all that I am is because of her. And uh, she's just amazing. And then um, to meet my wife, uh, 19, you know, Mary in 1986, and the fact that she's put it with me this long, I don't even know how that's possible. So I would say those are my inspirations. From the back of the bus to the front of the classroom, my 30 year mm. journey mm. as a deaf and blind professor published in 2019 by mm. Monday Cook Creek Publishing. It chronicles your 30 years mm. as a black and blind professor in the field of communication studies and also looks at um, your experiences and how race and differently abled intersectionally have influenced mm. documented encounters. So why write this book now? Well, I'm, I was thinking I'm getting old, duh, <laughs> and uh, I want to put some of these stories down before I forget them. And uh, another reason too, you know, I I don't know of any other black and blind professor in our field of communication. There may be someone else, but I don't know them. And in some ways, that's that's a awesome responsibility. So I wanted to leave like a, 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 a trail for the next person that comes along in the field of communication studies, you know, that might learn something from my story. And then one day I was just sitting and I was thinking, I was coming up on 2018, 2019, I wanted to do a sabbatical and I was like, what do I want to do? And my mind went back to the first time I walked in the classroom with my PhD in 1989 at Indiana University, South Bend. And I was like, wow, that's been 30 years. Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not put down some of those stories, some of those memories? And the book was born. You write, of course, as a blind person. So how did you do it? What were your what was your what were your processes and who helped you? Yeah, I mean, so many. Um, you know, I mean, one thing being blind since birth. So it's the only life I've known. So I learned all the coping skills at a very young age. Now, you know, but this is before, you know, cell phones and uh, internet and uh, all these great gadgets now that would have made my life so much easier in many ways. But I learned Braille at a young age. Um, I learned how to use readers at a, at, a, at, a, at a young age as well. There's a skill to that. And so I don't even know where to start with the help. Um, uh, just meeting people along the way. I think there's a chapter when I talk about my graduate days when my wife literally typed my entire dissertation by me dictating it to her. I mean, literally, 
night after night. She'd come in from work night after night after night. Uh, you can't even you can't even replace that kind of <laughs> that kind of wonderfulness. That's not a word, but it works for me. Um, I had great professors along the way. You know, I tell people I had three types of professors when I was coming up. This before ADA. The, the, the largest group were the people who tried to help me and said to me, look, you're the first blind student I've ever had. I don't know what to do. You tell me how to help you and we'll make it work. The second group, thankfully, was much smaller, but still there basically said, look, you sit over there in the corner. Don't bother me. I won't bother you. I'll give you a B or a C and let's get this done. It was not said that way, but it was understood. And then there were two or three that basically said to me, yes, this is 1970s, early 80s. I don't want you in my class. You don't want to be in my class. Let's not even go there. Thankfully, that large group was a group that worked with me. So I did everything from taking exams by tape recorder. Most of them I took by going to the professor's office and he would he or she would read me the exam and say, hey, what's your answer? I mean, you can't fake it. You better know it. And uh, and I always could type. So I typed some. I did everything possible to get through whatever class I had to do. Uh, and traveling, I've never been afraid of traveling, you know, so I, I, I grab my cane and go and walking. So I, you know, growing up in Chicago and then uh, Gary, Indiana, then Detroit. So I grew up in the big city. So I was never afraid of traveling as a blind person. It's all about competence. So I, I was never afraid of that. So all I had to do was learn some of the basic skills. I had the right attitude for it. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is I, uh, I grew up with sighted people. I know that sounds weird, but a lot of blind people don't. And so they're not comfortable in the sighted world. I've always been comfortable with sighted people. So I've known how to communicate with sighted people. I've known how to um, make them feel at ease or, or lessen the stress when they come in contact with me. Um, and that's been helpful too. I'm glad you mentioned traveling. Because you know my story. Yes, I do. <laughs> well, you ought to tell it again, though. We could go back a long way from the early days when I got here, or I'll say early days. 1997, I got here, and the Presidential Advisory Council on Disability and Accessibility Planning was in progress. And he had been a one-person advocate on this campus trying to get things changed. And so here I come, and then we become a two-person, <laughs> two-people advocate team. and. Um, so I got to know Dr. Smith a bit. And then one day I was wanting to go somewhere and I had to go by myself on an airplane because my husband had passed. And I saw him going up and down the street, just whistling. I said, where are you going? He said, Detroit. I said, with who? I didn't see anybody with him. And he said, I'm going by myself. How are you going to get there? Going to Columbus and get on the bus, get on the plane. Uh, okay, so he inspired me and so many others. That, like this quote says, you can do things you think you cannot do. Right. As uh, as the quote says from the, I think it's Truman. No, I won't say Truman. I forget her name, but right. the quote says, you can do the things you think you cannot do. Right. And so, yeah, Roosevelt. So I'm thankful for you for that and for so many other things you've done. But you said you would like to pick two or three stories, favorite stories and anecdotes, and tell them as exemplar exemplars of your academic journey. <laughs> What's one or two of those stories that you want to tell? <laughs> There's a nice segue. Let me tell the one about, and those of you who read the book, you know, you you, you know this story, but it's uh, one in grad school when I uh, was at Wayne State University, which by the way is the third largest school in Michigan. People forget about that place. It's like 30, almost 40,000 students there, although most of them are, you know, um, late, uh, local and that kind of thing, but there's a lot of dorms too. But so when I got there, um, I had to learn my way around campus. You know, I mean, I could have gotten to gone to the Commission for the Blind and got some a professional cane traveler to teach me, but I didn't have the time for that. You know, and I, I mean, I didn't want to waste their time because I didn't, I didn't need that. So I said, what is the best way for a blind guy to learn his way around this town and this university? And somebody hit me and said, find another blind person. I'm like. OK, that's easier said than done. And I went over to the uh, disability office one day and there was a blind guy working there. And uh, I said, hey, let me talk to you. We struck up a great friendship and I he taught me all the 
tricks of the trades, and there are there are tricks, you know, but totally blind. Now he had not lost his sight until he was in his twenties, so he was not new, you know, he was newly blinded. But he had learned a lot of those uh, tricks of the trade, and he taught me around that campus. And one of those tricks was one day we were walking. It was a nice sunshiny day, you know, and. We were walking to go get some lunch at this restaurant called Johnny's. I'll never forget a Greek restaurant called Johnny's. They had their best bread. And about two blocks from my uh, from my office. So he would meet me at my office. And we'd walk over because it was near his office. So so when he walk over for lunch and then we'd walk to his office or I'd let him go and I'd walk back. So we were walking one day and we're talking and nice sunshiny day. And he said, stop. And I was like, OK. And he's like, listen. And I stood there and he's, he's like, I was like, what? I mean, what, what are we listening for? And all of a sudden on my left, these loud high heel shoes came flying by zoom. They were, I mean, they were moving. And he was like, OK, he said, lock on to those high heel shoes and let's follow her. And we assumed it was a her. She's going our way and let's see how far she takes us. We followed that, those high heel shoes all the way to that restaurant. And I don't, I hope she never knew we were following her like that. He's like, that's just one of the tricks. And I was like, oh my goodness, only another blind guy could teach another blind person something like that. <laughs> so I had to include that. And he ultimately ended up coming to my wedding. I ended up coming singing at his wedding. It was an amazing relationship. Can you talk about the snake? Oh gosh. My public speaking teaching days. Which people always talk about, you know, how does a blind guy teach public speaking? I mean, that's in the book. You got to get the book to know how I had my little tricks. But I was teaching public speaking at University of Detroit. I never shall forget it. I don't think they call themselves that now. I think they're like Mercy College or something. And it was a cool winter morning. Uh, we usually had like seven speakers. So I think it was a fourth speaker that day. At that time, we used to have a lot of demonstration speeches, you know. People would come in and teach us how to make a cake or pizza or some other crazy thing. But another thing they would do sometimes is bring in like their aunt, their pets, you know, it's like, you know, so it's like, hey, this, you know, this is my pet and this is whatever, whatever. So this girl, she came up to me before class and she said, do you mind if I, uh, if my boyfriend and I uh, bring our, my cage, I'm speaking on Wednesday or Thursday. And I said, no, I've got, I've had pets all the time. So I don't, I don't care. Mm -hmm. So when they came in that morning, I was a little concerned when they slid the cage beside me because it was like really quiet. I'm like, whatever, you know, maybe, I don't know. She got up to speak and she, she, she stood, stood. One of my tricks was to stand right near, like hit, stand right near the podium so I can hear everything I could catch in terms of nonverbals and stuff like that. So I'm sitting there and she's like, reading her introduction like about you know two three feet from my uh head and i knew i was in trouble when she got to the end of her introduction line and she said now i want you to meet my friend and pet sam the snake and she reached over my back and pulled this ball constrictor out of her out of the cage and let it wrap itself around her like a few feet from my head. And I'm like, oh my goodness, here we go. And she said, it's good, it's a little cool in here because he's a little lethargic. And I'm like, yes, it is good, it's cool. <laughs> she did her speech, put the snake back in the cage. Her and her boyfriend took it out and they never came back to class again. <laughs> so I don't know if, I don't know if my face reveals, the kids seem to love it. I don't know why she never came back to class. After that, I said, you know what? No more live pets in this class. Bring a yeah. picture, bring a, 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 a stuffed animal, no more birds, because I'd had birds flying around, rabbits, no more live pets. <laughs> <laughs> I never shall forget that. In talking about issues of race, you discussed how some of your stories have been impacted by your race yeah. and your ethnicity. Yeah, I, you know, I thankfully, you know, one conclusion of this book is that thankfully I've been a blessed. I haven't had to deal with uh, too much blatant racism, uh, at least not not confrontational. But um, 
You know, there's a one story from my graduate days when one of our more famous faculty, he was a big hockey fan. He loved hockey. And um, and he was a big sports fan. So we talk about sports. And one day he was joking. We were talking and and uh, we were talking about athletes interviewing after games. You know how how they butcher the language sometime and they can't get a word out and you know, and and um, this was like 1987 or something. And he said, now, again, I must admit, I don't know whether he was joking or if like he had a look on his face, but I think he was serious. He said, you know, hockey players are the most intelligent. And I sort of chuckled and he walked off. And afterwards, I thought, OK, now this may be just me, but in 1987, I don't think there was not one non-Caucasian hockey player and I thought to myself, I'd like to have that encounter back and not let that be the last statement. So that was an issue. And then um, and then, uh, you know, here we uh, we we in our department, we had a uh, black female apply for one of our jobs and they came here and they didn't get the job for a lot of reasons and probably should not have. But what? her visit showed me when she left and she didn't get an offer, didn't get a job. It showed me how lonely I was. Uh, having her here for a couple of days, just being able to talk to her as a black female, I, it, it really crystallized to me how lonely I was. I mean, it took me a couple of months. I couldn't go to a faculty meeting for a couple of months because I was, I, I didn't know how lonely I was. I didn't know how starved I was for cultural interaction and exchange. And that really, that actually kind of shook me up because I didn't see that coming. So that's at least two experiences where, uh, where I, I'm pretty sure that, that it really turned the spotlight on my, on the issue of race for me. What did you learn writing this book about yourself, your experiences, experiences mm. rather than an academic um, book or an mm. article that you didn't know before about writing this and publishing that you didn't know? What did you learn? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, I, I learned that you know, age and time really does give you a perspective that nothing else really can. Um, as I was going down those memory lanes and um, thinking about some of those past experiences, uh, I used to go to weddings and events, and I hear the, when I was younger, I hear these older people say, "Yeah, 25 years ago I did this." And I'm like, "Oh my God, how old are they? 25?" And then I started doing the same thing, and I'm like, "Okay." And so, 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 so that that was a crystal clear lesson for me. It also this process also um, taught me to uh, really appreciate where I'm at. When I uh, wrote the chapter about how I got to Ohio and why I'm still here, and I, I got to relive why I stayed here, why, I mean, you have to read that chapter because it's a long story. I had no intention of coming to Ohio University. I'd never heard of it, never heard of Athens. And uh, when I discovered that school at that time, writing this book just made me think about what it was like to come here and how fortunate I've been to be treated as a professor who just happens to be blind. Now that might sound like a fairly innocuous statement, but this book taught me just how blessed I am. I I have never here um, like tokenized or uh, trivialized, or I've never felt 
like I was treated any different than any other faculty member here. That is an amazing, um, amazing conclusion to arrive at. When I um, when I finished the book, you know, I sat there and I was like, I, I was like, I came here in 1993, and 20 some years later, yes, things have changed, people have changed, the department is different. Um, but the humanity is still here. I still feel respected and uh, invited. Uh, and I, I, I felt so good that I, I, I never want to take that for granted, that I could put that down and I have wanted for years to put down that chapter, that story about how I came. I've told the story in a variety, of, a variety of settings, but to actually put down that chapter, I think it's chapter three, to actually put it down. When I finished reading chapter, I said to myself, now that's what I've wanted to do for years, to tell that story of how I got here and why I'm still here. That was, that was, that was uh, almost cathartic for me. Your book is on Amazon and a couple of quotes that people gave in their reviews. As a black and totally blind individual, he muses about how this distinction has both colored and shed light on what might have been an innocuous or unremarkable encounter. This memoir is riveting because of its vulnerability, candid honesty, and fresh transparency, as well as the conversational tone and quality. It's an easy read, but one that can also cause reflection and soul searching without much warning. So things just sort of sneak up on us, I know, as you read them. So you dealt with Amazon and other booksellers. That experience was probably not new, but what advice would you give to others who are thinking about writing but just don't know, or publishing and don't know the process? Yeah, well, sir, first I'd say if you get a good idea, you know, start putting it down. And it, it helped me to have to have written the manuscript. I was my goal was to write it while looking for a publisher, and I did that. And it and and I got a couple rejections, and that that gets discouraging, you know. It's like, and I wrote one place that was ideal for this book, and they wrote back and told me we only publish two books a year, and we have like two hundred. Uh, I'm like, well, okay, <laughs> so. I, so I finished the books, didn't have a publisher, and I was like, okay, but at least I got the manuscript. So, cause they always want to see a chapter or part of it. So I could show them the whole book. And I was talking to a friend and he said, have you heard of so-and-so locally? I'd never heard of Monday Creek. And I sent them the book and they talked it over with their people and and sent me back the contract and we start that process. It's been a wonderful experience. Not only not only are they local, but Gene is such a wonderful person. Um, easy to get a hold of, uh, easy to get the copies of books I need. I can get 10 copies or 200 copies. You know, she can have it done uh, and just so supportive. And, 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 and it just made me feel good to be able to work with somebody locally like that. So I'm sure that not everybody's publishing experience is as awesome as mine has been because you got to find that right publisher. She uh, she makes suggestions. She uh, she helps where she can in terms of publicity and setting up, uh, you know, marketing opportunities. But the the other part of it is just the invitational atmosphere of the company you know and she publishes everything from memoirs to children's books i recommended her to another colleague of mine and now that now his book's coming out it's gonna be amazing and and he did the same thing he was looking for publishers and kept getting rejected and then getting contracts that didn't suit his and i said talk to her and he came here and went out to her to her place and the rest is history. I, I don't want to give his book away, but it's going to be amazing. So, so that that is how the process worked for me. Uh, 
she will support me and send me emails about book contests or ways to publish my uh, market my book. Uh, that 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 that's just wonderful. And she, what I like about her too is she she just sees a good you know sees a good product. You know she and she she's local. She's all about promoting Southeast Ohio. That that is. She is like a quiet gem around here that more and more people need to know about. Uh, absolutely more and more need to know about. Dean Kelly and Jen, I know you want to leave time for questions. I just have a couple of more questions from those who are viewing. How much more time do we have? I'd say maybe another 10 minutes, Dr. Lewis. For interview? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Open up to questions. JW, will there be a sequel? <laughs> will there be a sequel? Uh, 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 uh. Not like this. This is the last. So yes, I am revealing something today. So this is the last I'm going to write about me. Uh, I feel like I've gotten the story out. But don't tell anybody this. But starting next year, I'm going to write a novel, a mystery novel. I love uh, adventure, mystery. <laughs> I love books about assassins. I know, don't, don't. Uh, and so I'm going to write a book like that. I have this concept and uh, ooh, I, I almost I don't want to give it away because somebody might steal my idea and I will not be happy. But that's going to be my next thing. I'm going to spend next year writing this book. I've always wanted to try my hand at, you know, uh, speeding traffic and uh, mystery. And <laughs> so that will be my sequel. <laughs> You've been teaching for more than 30 years and uh, lots of experiences, mm. lots places you've gone, people you've met. How are you able to condense? I think the problem a lot of people have is they've got so much. So how do you condense that? How did you do it into that book and determine which stories you were going to tell? Yeah, I when I got the concept, I just took notes. I, I, I was chapter and said, OK, what can I remember from my graduate days that will fit this uh, experience? Like when I walked out of my advisor's office one day, we had met about the dissertation. And once I really recognized what I needed to do to do it, and I was like, oh my God, you know, you know, I'm blind. I, I have these limits. I, don't, we, I, I didn't even own a computer at the time. I, uh, I was like, and how am I going to do this research? I walked out of that office and went around the corner and I had about 10 minutes of pity and there's no way, I, I, don't, I don't even know how I'm going to do this. So those kind of stories would come up with each chapter and then my first job, I'm like, what happened there? The only thing I regret is not telling more about the, the uh, National Blind Educator award. I I should have included more about that process when I look when I, it hit me after the book was done. And I was like, man, I should have expanded that because it was a great process. It was a national uh, award. There was a great story done on it in the in the Braille monitor. I should have included it. So that's the one thing that I regret that I that I wish I had put in. But the other condensing was, you know, was all a part of what 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 fit the profile. And I've gone back over now that I've done and I've said, uh, was there any story I missed? That I, other than the uh, national, the, the blind educators, any other thing I've missed that I wish I could put in? And I'm pretty, I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty confident, confident that I got the ones in that I wanted to get in starting in 1985. <laughs> Yes, uh, especially the one too about my friend, the same guy that taught me the high heel approach to traveling. He and I uh, decided to take a cross a cross country trip on the bus from uh, Detroit to uh, 
Wichita, Kansas to attend this uh, conference, which took four buses. And, you know, at that time, if you're a blind person, you could take a sighted person on with you for free. Well, I'm blind, my friend's blind, and we're cheap. We're grad students. I mean, come on. We're... So we decided to cook up this scheme where he would pretend to be my sighted guide. So we would have to pay. <laughs> and so we, uh, we're taking these buses, and I'm pretty sure these drivers figured it out when he ran into a few doors, tried to sit us down in seats where people were. <laughs> I'm sure they were like, okay. But that was just stuff you did. <laughs> And I, just another fun time we had. <laughs> I went to a conference with you. If you've never gone to a conference with Dr. Smith, you must. One of the most fun times and interesting times <laughs> you've yeah. ever had. He's one of the most humorous people that I know. Really? Intellectual, great sense of humor. Well, you gotta and, be fun. Uh, I mean, you gotta have fun. You gotta, you know, life is too short. And good God, you, you we know that now. It's too short to... I mean, look, I don't want to minimize people. Oh, I'm going to say something else. People are struggling in lottery, and, and so that's real. And I'm not, I'm not advocating Pollyannishness, but I'm saying you got to do whatever it takes to get as much out of life as you can. And that reminds me, I don't think this uh, review is in, is on Amazon, but someone called me once and told me. You know how reading my book, and I—I I mean, you don't even know. You don't even know. I'm sure I'm not the only author who's gotten this, but but you don't even know when you get when someone calls you and they say, "Reading your book helped me literally continue to want to live my life." You know, what do you do with that? You just, you just, you just, you just thank God for the opportunity. You humbly thank them because no one has to share that kind of thing. And that's that's the power of communication. You, 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 when, I, when I perform, when I do music and sing, I'm always saying to myself, I have sung this song 20 times, but it might be the first time somebody's hearing this today and they may really need to hear it. So I don't want to slack off. Yeah, it's been a long day. It may be the third night of a three, one night stand thing. But somebody needs to hear this song and I'm going to push myself to do it. Even though I just did it last night, I've done it for 20 years. I'm tired of it. But if it's going to help them get through something, I'm going to give it all I got. As I close my portion and turn it over to Jen, I just want to say that you said in an interview that your big takeaway is that you're no different than anybody else, no more special, and you're just blessed to be in this country and have this opportunity and the love and support you've had through the years which made all of this possible. And I just want to add that you are a living testimony of a quote by Pablo Picasso. He said, I'm always doing that which I cannot do, that's you, <laughs> in order that I may learn how to do it. So mm -hmm. JW lives out his own creed Mm -hmm. that our differences can be strengths and that many people live more for, for affirmation than bread and that we are responsible to all for all. He has a way about him that is gentle yet strong and a style of engaging both young and old alike. JW, who sings and, and whistles along the way, as always, it's been a pleasure. Me so too. Uh, Jen will now take questions. From those of you who are viewing and thank let me just say this thank you. this is my this is the, i mean we are you talk about one two punch of ou i mean when they see us coming <laughs> i mean we have god has allowed us to do some wonderful things here in a limited amount of time and she said this to me so i'm going to say it to her publicly you know in many ways she is the sister i never had and wanted to have. I have two sisters. One passed away last year. Her birthday will be next week and that's uh, that'll be tough. And then I have another sister, but we were we were never really close. And so in many ways, Dr. Lewis is that sister that I wish. Wish that I had had and, and I'm glad to have. 
Thank you so much for doing this. You're amazing. You're welcome. You got me now. Can't get rid of me. (laughs) Jen? Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Smith. Um, Okay, we're going to open it up to audience questions now for either of our, our speakers today. You can either type your question into the chat and I will moderate or you can raise your hand and then you know you can unmute and ask the question yourself however you feel more comfortable. Okay, I'll ask first. Um, Dr. Smith, could you compare the process and the intellectual process and the the differences between writing your dissertation Mm -hmm. and any of your books? That's a great question. Uh, For me, um, so I, I sort of approached a dissertation, you know, as more of a sort of scholarly thing. I was, as you might expect, I, I had to keep in mind the audience and um, also the process of checking and rechecking the facts and the uh supporting documentation you know that was important so that was very similar in in the books that i've written as well but the the difference for me was to get comfortable um with the personal side of the of the books that i that i've done not all of them like the campaign book that was you know that's, that was for a specific class and campaign communication. So that was driven by that. The essays on the blind and visually impaired, um, that was a compilation process in talking about a aspect of our area of, of the field that was very barren. Um, so when I write, when I wrote this memoir, it was all about how much to disclose um, how to tell a story that would be as important and informative uh, to me it, 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 that it might be for someone else. You know, I'm always so so the the um, the deciding factor for me in either the dissertation or books is can I answer the so what question? So what? Why should anybody care? And I'm always asking that. If I picked up this chapter, picked up this book, picked up this dissertation, can I say as a as a person in the audience, okay, I get that. I can get something from that. And I'm always asking that question. And I answer that better times than sometimes than others. <laughs> but thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Thank you. All right, Dr. Smith, we've got a question in chat from uh, Judy Carey Nevin. She would like to know if you were ever thinking of pursuing singing before you decided to go for your advanced degrees and and what made you follow the path that you chose? Yeah, that's, well, you guys are good. I uh, started singing like 10, 11 years old. My brother and I, you know, we thought we were like, the, you know, you had the Jackson 5. We thought we were like the Smith 2 <laughs> out there at the time. You know, we had our little afros and he played drums and I played guitar. <laughs> we started singing at those at those times. And I started professionally singing as a teenager. Gospel for the most part. The uh, blind boys of Alabama have tried to sign me several times. I al- they almost got me in 1982. They had to contract. I went to one of their shows. They had to contract. They were like, we'll give you a couple hours to go pack and go with us. I mean, I almost did it. Uh, I wonder what my life would have been like if I joined up with them back then. But I always knew, see, I was a music therapist for a while. So I I enjoyed the music, but I, I eventually the therapist just wore, the therapy just wore me down. Uh, so I always knew that music would be a part of my life. But I, uh, but once I made up my mind to get, get the PhD, I decided that I want to be a person that would um, teach by day and sing by night. 
So I didn't want to try to earn a living as a musician. I wanted to pick the spots when I wanted to. But another great question. All right, we have a couple comments in the chat also thanking both of you. Uh, so Tasha Attaway, excuse me, uh, she says, I would like to thank this dynamic duo for your advocacy and willingness to share your experiences so transparently. It is absolutely wonderful to see and hear both of you. And Beatrice, and I apologize, Beatrice, I cannot pronounce your last name. Um, it says, this has been wonderful, educational, empowering. One is the presence of is in the presence of greatness whilst listening to my friend, Mr. Feelgood. Thank you to my sister, <laughs> Carolyn. See both of my incredible friends. That's my buddy. And, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yes. Um, and I actually have a question for you, Dr. Smith. You talked a little bit about um, the different processes for writing this memoir and um, your thesis, and I'm wondering what are you looking forward to most in your next novel, your mystery novel, in that process? Getting away from both approaches. I want to just let my imagination run wild. So that's what I'm looking forward to, like really upping my creativity. Um, and it'll probably be a real mess when I get done, but I'm looking forward to trying it. <laughs> okay, and it looks like uh, John McCarthy, you have your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? I would. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, really enjoyed this. Um, I went to Amazon uh, since you since you brought that up uh, before, and I was reading a uh, comment by uh, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> and um, you, in your comment, you talked about uh, disability coming before race. And I, I was just wondering if you both could just talk about that maybe a little bit more. For me, it's why? Uh, wh why is that so salient? Um, and, and just uh, I was hoping to hear about that from both of you. Dr. Lewis, why don't you start that one? That's an interesting question. Thank you, John. If if I decide to go somewhere, mm. I don't think about what color I am, but can I get through the door? Mm. If I go to a lodging facility, a hotel, uh. can I get in the bed? Can I get through the bathroom? Can I mm. get to the restaurant? Mm. Mm. If I'm going on a bus, I mean, things are much better now, especially yes. since the ADA. But those are things that you mm. still are concerned about. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yes. Sometimes I would have a scout to say, go in there, we stop somewhere at a restaurant, right. to, get to, these, to the restroom and to the, the seats are not too close together. So I'm not worried about, no, I can get in a place. That's, that's not the issue. I know I can get to campus and get to school, mm. but yeah. can I get up the hill? Can I get on the elevator? Uh, there are some elevators on campus, believe it or not, that you can get in them, but you can't close the door. Mm. So you learn where these spaces are, what ramps are good to use, things have changed, yeah. have changed. and um, what just the climate, the environment will be like, the structures. And so that's the first thing you think about. If there's an automatic door opener, is it going to come back and hit me in the face mm. or is it going to be okay that I can get through the door. So John, that's the reason that you think about disability first, and then you think about race second. Uh, Thank you. John, uh, it's in, I think I mentioned in the book in the first part, I say, um, I do a, a, I do a um, little thing. I may have, may have done it when I've spoken over in your place, but I, I tell people, close your eyes. And I take out my cane and I and I say, when you open your eyes, tell me what you see first, a blind person or a black person. And invariably the blindness wins. Uh, and I think that is still true. Now, what's so ironic about that is probably, John, 50 years ago, the reverse might have been true, right? Uh, in so many ways. So I think, Dr. Lewis, you don't have, you can agree or disagree. I, I think in some ways it's gotten better in that we both sort of feel that in most cases the, the, the differently abled sort of supersedes the race 
issue except in certain really specific context? And That's well, a great I, question. Though. I agree. Um, I went to um, a conference one time in Norfolk. My floor was my room was on the 16th floor. So I'm always trying to get a lower floor. At least I can just scoot down the steps if there's a fire or anything. And I said, do you have a lower room? Uh, what would I do if there's a fire? All they told me is we know where you are. So I'm not concerned about what color I am in those <laughs> rooms. <laughs> I'm concerned. About <laughs> so that's that's the bottom line. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, these these hierarchies uh, that are around there when you start um, looking at those. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. So thanks for that comment. And I, I was going to say, in addition to your example there, uh, Dr. Smith, with what do you see first? Uh, that and temporarily able-bodied people, I think are the two things that I will always use with my students. Uh, yes. So you've, you've left me with both of those and I appreciate it. You're so welcome. I think we have time for one last question and it's it's in our chats um, and Judy Carey Nevin is wondering Dr. Smith um, what your editing process is like. Could you describe that for us? Oh, great, great. Yeah. yeah, for me, first I write the book in my head. I have to get the outline and the concepts in my head. So I and I, I so I take down notes. I can't I can't just write the manuscript straight. I take notes and then what work what has worked best for me I pray about Lord finding me a good typist, someone that can type fast, but also I give them certain amount of editorial license. And you know what? You know the best way I write? I walk and I talk. So I walk around the office and I talk, and it's up to them to get it down for me. And then we go back and edit and clean it up. But the old preacher in me, I, I need to stand up and walk around and talk and and not have to worry about somebody can't spell or can't get it or can't keep up you know i gotta find the right person to do that and i i was so blessed to find a grad student here i was i was talking to her one day and, it, and it's like something said to me ask her and oh was she great she could just sit here and then she could she would say what about this word and 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 drop it in so casually and I had to write I had the opportunity to either um, approve it or disapprove it but she could do it in a way that wouldn't break up my flow um, but you know it's constantly editing and then for this book though I had another person that I really respected and I would send them each chapter please tear it apart tell me are you getting it tell me what you would recommend you uh, what changes you'd make and sometimes it's in back changes i would i would accept them sometimes i'd say no i like it this way that worked well for me and i like that process for me and you had a wonderful book signing too oh man yeah that, that was great i mean long little, little and down, oh the book said little professor book center here so go help my friends out and every dime that that book sells down there it's all for him uh, that store i want i want that store to stay open so i get no cost of that Go support them, but it was a wonderful book sign. It had 30, 40, 50 people come through there in that two hour span. It was wonderful on October 4th, 2019. It was just a wonderful time. I, I had never had one, so I didn't know what to expect. It was it was awesome. And this has been awesome too. I mean, good God, the time's gone and I love it. Oh, thank, you. thank you both so much for the fabulous stories for sharing your time uh it's, it has been wonderful and i can't believe the time is over already I can't um use. yeah so i would i think jen's gonna pop a link into the chat yeah, that a nice. little avowal form and we would like all of you to please give us feedback about how we can continue to, to provide programming um that you're interested in attending and as fabulous as this. And I would like to thank Jen for all of her yes. hard work because she did thank all you, of the hard Absolutely. work to get these two people here with us today. It has been great. And finally, we are very happy to that you might consider joining us on uh, November 16 at 2.30 for our next event mm -hmm. where uh, Dr. Jenny Klein, Ohio professor of art history, will be interviewing Carol Genshaft and Deidre Hamler who are co-curating a um, 
exhibit at the Columbus um, Library called Rag Ragging on Art, the Art of Amina Brenda Lynn Robertson's House and Journal. It will be very exciting, maybe as exciting as this. <laughs> Thank you both so, so much and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone for joining us.